And hi, Judy, and I'll just reiterate, we'll start at 1025. So you've still got a few more minutes if you need it. Okay. Doctor, can you hear us here at IIT? Yes. Do you want me to put this, the PowerPoint on now? Um, that's up to you, Doctor. I'll, like I said, I'll give a brief introduction um, before you begin. So if you'd like to be on camera briefly, just to kind of welcome everyone before you start, feel free. Okay. But the choice is absolutely yours. OK, great. I'm just kind of like making things look okay here. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very nice setup, so I don't think anyone will mind it all that much. <laughs> okay, I'll be right back. Doctor, can you share your screen with us, please? Hi, Chuck. Uh, Dr. Phillip actually just stepped away briefly. When she sits back down, we'll let her know. Do we know how many people are on Zoom and how many people are there? Hi, Dr. Phillip. Actually, I'll answer that question in a moment. In the meantime, our, uh, our AV person has asked if you can share your screen at this time. Yep. We'll, we'll get that okay. set up. So it looks like we have about five or six participants on Zoom, and I know we have upwards of 30, maybe a little bit more in person today. Okay. Okay, so there's my Zoom. Is that okay? I think so. We might have Chuck comment on that. Chuck, how does that look? This is Chuck at IIT. We see your screen. Everything looks good. Okay. Good. Great. Great. Just wait a couple more minutes and then we'll get started. Okay. Thank you.
I just have to mute. Okay, doctor, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay, so start right now. Absolutely. Go right ahead, doctor. Okay. So thank you all for joining us again. And here is Dr. Phillip with one of our first breakout sessions. Take it away, Dr. Phillip. Hi, everybody. Nice to meet you all. I'm sorry I'm not there in person, but there is a great message that I want to share with you, and that is about inflammation. And you can always um, hear about inflammation. I'm going to try to move my cursor here. Whoops, why isn't it not moving? I think I know why there. Okay, so inflammation is everywhere. And we need inflammation because that's part of healing for us. So if we're injured, we want some inflammation to be part of wounds, wound repair, but we don't want chronic inflammation. So chronic inflammation causes cell and tissue damage. It causes chronic pain. And for many people who don't want aging, it actually accelerates the look of aging on our body. So what does inflammation have to do with it? Well, inflammation comes from our environment. It comes from what we eat. It comes from some of our genetic factors that we can control because there's something called epigenetics. Epigenetics means things that influence our genes from the environment. So many people in the past used to think, well, it's just cholesterol that causes cardiovascular disease. However, what causes cholesterol to build up in the blood vessels is inflammation. So we have inflammation in a blood vessel and the body says, hey, we want to wall off this inflammation. Let's put some cholesterol on the blood vessel to wall it off. And then we get more and more cholesterol building up in the blood vessel. And then we get heart disease or it builds up in the very small vessels of our heart. Autoimmune disease is definitely inflammation, not just rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, diseases of aging are also diseases of inflammation. We'll talk a little bit about inflammation in the bowel because where inflammation usually starts is in the GI tract. Asthma, eczema, psoriasis, they are all part of inflammation, as well as obesity because obesity increases the production of inflammatory cytokines that then causes more body fat to be retained. And there's even more than this. So how do we measure inflammation? Well, we measure inflammation from a sedimentation rate, but that's very nonspecific, but that can still tell us if we have inflammation in the body. There's also a highly sensitive C-reactive protein that measures inflammation and is associated with a very high risk of an MI, which means a myocardial infarction. Also, we find inflammation elevated in Alzheimer's disease. So even though somebody may have the genes for Alzheimer's disease, it doesn't mean that they're going to get uh, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease. It means that if they have the inflammation with it, like high amounts of foods, alcohol, et cetera, that cause inflammation, then that can cause inflammation in the brain itself. When we sleep, we detox the brain. But if we don't get good sleep as well as what we eat, then that can cause the inflammation to continue to appear. Cancer is also elevated as inflammation, arthritis, acute infections have inflammation and physical trauma has inflammation. So let's talk a little bit. We already talked about cardiovascular disease, but if you see this blood vessel here, we've got an accumulation of plaque or harder cholesterol that's building up in the blood vessel. So if someone has homocysteine, which is a high level of something that is genetic that causes the B6 and B12 to not get cycled and not be able to break down the inflammation in the blood vessel, that can cause a problem. If someone has infection that's continually not addressed, that can cause inflammation in the blood vessel as well as oxidized cholesterol. So when we're measuring cholesterol, many times we're looking at the oxidized type because that is what's causing more inflammation in the blood vessel. And then inflammatory foods, which we will speak of and address today because that's the number one thing that we can do to work with inflammation. So the immune system also autoimmune inflammation. So when people have osteoarthritis, it has to do also with inflammation in the joint. 
It's different than rheumatoid arthritis, but it still is inflammation. And other diseases that I work with patients with, such as lupus and Sjogren's disease, but also inflammation in the muscles, inflammation in the skin, are all a result of inflammation. So when people have colds and flu, otitis media, that is an acute inflammatory reaction. And the good part would be for us to work with it so that that can get rid of the bacteria or the virus. So we don't want to decrease the inflammation in some areas because we want the body to inflame itself to be able to burn off the virus and burn off anything that's in the way, like the bacteria. So celiac disease, some people um, have problems with wheat and gluten and don't have celiac disease, but individuals who have celiac disease definitely have inflammation in their intestines and the cells there get so inflamed that they don't absorb nutrients. But some people find that with food intolerances and food allergies that these foods can cause inflammation. And when they decrease those foods, they find that they feel much better. I had a patient once who told me that she was a little upset with me on the second visit. She had rheumatoid arthritis. And I said, well, why are you upset? She said, because I took pizza out of my diet and my joints feel fantastic because pizza was inflammatory for her. But that's one way of getting rid of the problem rather than taking um, something that might not get rid of the problem for them. So inhalant allergies, if some people have a lot of seasonal allergies, when I work with them, decreasing the inflammatory foods that they eat, they say, wow, this is the first season that I haven't had hay fever, I haven't had allergies. And it's basically because we decrease the inflammation in our body so that when the, the, hay, the hay or the type of plant came around and was blooming, she didn't have as much inflammation because there was other inflammation that was decreased in her body. So most of us know a little bit about inflammation in the gut, people who have irritable bowel syndrome, who have chronic diarrhea or chronic constipation, that has to do with inflammation in the gut. And what I've done with people is work with them on what foods are specifically causing inflammation and they're amazed that it causes a difference. And some of my staff in the past have said, you know, this person's really nice to us at the desk. And I said, it's because their bowels were so inflamed, they were really angry in the gut level. And now that their bowels are not inflamed, they're feeling so much better about themselves. So the gut is a little brain and that little brain actually can be inflamed and when it's inflamed, people get very irritable and that's why they call it irritable bowel syndrome also. So reflux can be inflammation. There is something called eosinic esophagitis, which is kind of like reflux. They thought at first that people had reflux, but it's an inflammation from certain foods that are moving through the esophagus causing inflammation. Certainly inflammation in the stomach called gastritis ulcers and things like that. Um, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, which is called irritable bowel disease, diverticulitis, and then chronic sinusitis. If you think about the fact that your nasal passageways all the way down your, through your intestines are the same um, type of tissue, chronic sinusitis is also inflammation. Now, when I work with patients, I will also look at why are they having chronic sinusitis? And for some people, it's their environment. So remember the picture of the environment affecting inflammation? So when they have mold in their house, that is causing their chronic sinusitis. So I'm like a little detective trying to figure out what could be causing the inflammation for the person. And sometimes it's something in their house. And once they remediate the mold in their house, they feel much better. And they feel much better in many ways. They have more um, energy, they sleep better. And so inflammation is the groundwork of everything. So speaking of sleep, we rejuvenate our body when we're sleeping. And many times when I work with people to decrease the inflammatory foods they put in their body, or I'll do a detox for the fall and the spring, they will say to me, how come I can sleep better? And you sleep better because you have less inflammation and the GI tract is not waking you up from the inflammation. Now we must have, everybody must know about inflammation because anti-inflammatory drugs are used all the time. So 30 billion tablets of NSAIDs are sold every year. And for stronger NSAIDs that are prescriptions, 70 million prescriptions are given. 
So what are, what are they giving this for is the inflammation does cause pain. And the inflammation also can cause a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack. So a small amount of aspirin, ibuprofen for a short period of time is good. And we also do give a very, very low NSAID for patients if they have some type of a heart to prevent heart disease. However, there is many people who have GERD and they have inflammation because of the fact that they're using so many anti-inflammatory drugs. So the biggest question is why don't we figure out what's causing the inflammation so we don't have to take all these inflammatory drugs. So there's fats. Some fats cause inflammation and some fats decrease inflammation. So arachidonic acid is an omega-6 that can cause inflammation, hydrogenated vegetable shortening, stick margarines, all those kind of things interfere with how the body works with omega-3s handling in the body. So high amounts of red meat for a long period of time. So I have an uncle that had heart surgery three times and basically all he did was eat high amounts of beef all the time and a few vegetables, but because he had so much saturated fat in his body, the saturated fat was causing inflammation and then causing his blood vessels to close. So what's an anti-inflammatory fat? An anti-inflammatory fat encourages the body to decrease inflammation. So you've probably heard of fish oil that some people are taking, but you can also get that from fatty fish. You can get it from algae. You can also get omega-3s from flax, pumpkin oil, walnut, and soy. So eating the foods that are anti-inflammatory can be go a long way to decrease the inflammation. Now, stress will also increase inflammation and all the more reason to make sure we're eating anti-inflammatory foods in our diet to combat the everyday stress that we have. So this is a um, quote that I'll read to you, the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. It's impossible to have only omega-3s unless you're a vegetarian that is not eating any meat. But by favoring the production of EPA in the body, the omega-3s are by decreasing the dietary um, or by increasing the dietary intake of EPA and DHA, you can have reduction in chronic diseases that involve the inflammatory process process, most notably in cardiovascular disease, irritable bowel, cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, but also psychiatric and neurodegenerative diseases. So DHA is very helpful for the brain. And by decreasing inflammation, you decrease inflammation in the brain and you give nutrients to the brain to make the myelin sheath that helps the neurons move and conduct impulses so that you can think better. Other anti-inflammatory fats, there's something called gamma linoleic acid, and that behaves as an anti-inflammatory omega-3. Um, it enhances suppression of inflammation. So you might have heard of borage oil, black currant oil, evening primrose oil, and even human milk for babies is very anti-inflammatory. So omega-3 works with omega Omega-9 works with omega-3 as an anti-inflammatory diet, and omega-9 is the GLA. That can be from olive oil, avocados, macadamia nuts, and other types of oil. So inflammation that we see is really the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more inflammation underneath the iceberg that we need to address. And if we can get underneath the iceberg and address it, then we don't have this iceberg of inflammation. So where does it start? So the intestinal lining has a very protective barrier. There are goblet cells that secrete mucus and there's good flora. So when people have a colonoscopy, many times they tell me that, well, I don't feel good for about a week after it. And it's because the body has lost a lot of its gut flora and the appendix goes ahead and has a little sampling of the flora that we normally have. And this appendix sends out the gut flora and the body starts making more gut flora. And so after a week to 10 days, people start to feel better after they've had their colonoscopy because now they've got the good flora. So they could call, you could call it microbiota. 
these microbiota do enzyme reactions in our body. They're very important for us. They're very important for crowding out the bacteria that are not healthy, actually helping the brain, the little nervous system in the gut, and many other things that are important. So there also are enterocytes, cells that line and absorb nutrients, but in our gut, we also have our immune system. So there's something called mucosa associated lymphatic tissue. And sometimes what I'll give to people is a castor oil pack, not that they drink the castor oil, but the pack that they put over their abdomen to increase blood flow to that area to help with their immune system, help with constipation, help with reflux and many things like that because it increases blood flow for healing. So I'm really the 80-20 person. I don't say that you have to do 100% foods that are anti-inflammatory, but I work with people so that they can feel what their own body feels like. So when I take people off inflammatory foods, many times they come back and they go, I can't believe it, I feel so much better. And it's basically because they are taking away foods that cause inflammation in their gut. When inflammation happens in our gut, there's tight junctions that open up. And so some of the bacteria in the gut and some of the other inflammatory cytokines get to other places in the body, such as they get into the joints. So what I do is have people go off these foods just for three weeks to see. And then after that, they can add the food in. It's their own science test. And when they add the food in, find out, do they feel worse? Do they feel better? So for myself, when I first started working 20 years ago at Northwestern, I had heard that some people with multiple sclerosis do better off wheat and gluten. And I said, okay, if I'm going to tell my patients to do something, I need to try it myself. So I went off wheat and gluten and I went, oh my goodness, I can think better. My joints are better. I have more energy. And so since then, and now everybody knows about inflammatory the inflammation that some people feel with wheat and gluten and junk food and things like that. So now everybody's writing about it. But back then at Northwestern, everybody thought I was a little bit of a, maybe I would say a little witch because they were like, there's no scientific research for this, but yeah, everybody was starting to feel better in their body. So right now we know that our diet contains 30%, 30 times more pro-inflammatory foods than nutrients than a century ago. Inflammation primes our body for out of control inflammatory reactions and especially age related wear and tear. So when I've had people go off inflammatory foods, what's been very interesting is they say, my friends think that I had a facelift and they haven't had a facelift, but the body is pushing out the toxins and the crappy foods that they're eating to their skin. And now it's not doing it anymore. So their skin is more vitalized. They have more blood flow to the skin in a positive way and they look much better. So there is now research on decreased in inflammation from foods. So this I would call the SAD diet, the standard American diet of bread, cheese, meat, all the things that can be inflammatory. Now remember, I'm the 80, 20% person. Once people get and know what it feels like to eat foods that are inflammatory, then I'll say, okay, you're the test pilot. You can decide what foods you eat. So before I give a big presentation, I may not eat some of the foods that I enjoy because I do enjoy ice cream. You can't take ice cream from me, but if I'm gonna give a presentation, I need a lot of energy. I'm gonna say, hey, I'm gonna be really strict before this presentation so that I have everything going to my brain that I need. So these are foods, these are also very inflammatory. So if we look at chocolate, sugar is extremely inflammatory. Um, the potatoes are not bad, but it's what it's fried in. So usually it's fried in a lot of saturated fats. And the hamburger is not bad either, but a lot of people do better without wheat and gluten. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And some people need their coffee or they need a lot of caffeine from chocolate. So one of the things that we know is when people go off these things, they can't believe that they feel much better. So what decreases inflammation in terms of foods? Well, what decreases inflammation we know for sure is eating turmeric, which is um, curcumin. Many people put the spices on foods and curcumin is not spicy. But there is a research study that showed that people who use specific spices, especially curcumin, 
those countries have way less cancer. And the countries that have less of this on their foods, they have way more cancer. And that's a scientific study that's done, has, is in the research. But pineapple, tumor, um, papaya, mango, those things are very anti-inflammatory. They're kind of like a meat tenderizer. When somebody has been walking a long period of time or hiking, if they have these foods, they're very anti-inflammatory because walking can have that problem. I put here some of the cruciferous vegetables and cabbages and onions and all those vegetables are very anti-inflammatory. So it's better for people to do like 80% of the healthy foods in their diet. I have people do a stir fry so they get all their vegetables in their diet. Now, if people hate vegetables, I try to find a vegetable they've never tried before and make sure that we put some things on it that makes it taste good to them. Also resveratrol is very anti-inflammatory and it's also an antioxidant. It is found in wine. However, it is also found in grapes. So it's not true that you can only drink wine. And I find that there are people who drink two glasses of wine at night. And that is an extreme amount in terms of if you're wanting to prevent breast cancer. But certainly if you're going to, to eat grapes or drink wine, you need to have them organic because many of the chemicals that are in these foods are causing problems in the body and causing cancer, as you well know. Green tea is a very powerful antioxidant, so much better than coffee. Um, coffee is an herb. I like coffee, but it's only an herb to be used in a very small amount. Coffee now is, you know, some people I see are drinking six to eight cups of coffee. They'll get a headache if they go off coffee. So I don't take them off right away, but I work with them to decrease it. And many times I find that there's a protein shake that I give to people. I've been giving it to them for 20 years now. And they um, find that they have more energy from this protein shake that has a multiple vitamin in it that's well absorbed. They have more energy than coffee. So I also am more like a detective, like why are you needing coffee? And most people are needing coffee to get energy. So we try to figure out what's causing them to not have the energy and many times it's their sleep. So then we work with them to help decrease the sleep. So I just wanted to highlight curcumin. Curculin is a dietary spice. Some people put it as topical on pain. It's very anti-inflammatory. I had a patient who had back surgery. He still was in pain. He was on very high pain medications, changed his diet by decreasing inflammation and went ahead and gave him curcumin around the clock because it's very good for your liver also. And he came back, he was off all his drugs. Um, and we did a, t there, one of the TV stations did a whole thing on, on him. He actually owned a restaurant. Um, and so there's, there's cl clinical trials showing that curcumin is good in decreasing any type of colorectal cancer or preventing colorectal cancer. And by the way, some of the drugs that we give um, for cancer, because that's one of my special areas is working with patients in the, in the area of naturopathic oncology, is some of the drugs that we give have the same effects as some of our foods. However, the drugs are much more um, concentrated. So if we're eating these foods continually, we're helping to give ourselves a little bit of that drug that's preventative. So here's overall the top foods that I think for prevention, for decreasing of inflammation, for helping with uh, a person to look younger, um, green tea, fish, organic grapes, garlic, onions, curcumin, and certainly cruciferous vegetables. Now, I remember when I was a kid, we ate vegetables out of a can and I hated them. And that's the problem is a lot of people have had vegetables that just don't taste that good, but you can make vegetables taste really good. So what I'll do sometimes is I'll just, I have an electric grill outside. I'll cut up all these vegetables, put them in the electric grill in a, in a skillet, and then I'll have vegetables for a couple of days. So the environmental working group has put out every year a listing of the most contaminated vegetables and fruits and those that are the best. Uh, and so when we're looking at 
eating organic foods, it's really hard to eat out and have, know that you're getting organic foods all the time because the chemicals in the organic foods can lead to cancer. So what they do is they publish a list and they say, for this year, these are the highly contaminated vegetables and fruits. And so if you're looking at your budget, these would be the ones that I either avoid or I make sure that I get organic. However, they put the clean 15 out and these are things that you don't need to worry about it being organic because they actually have way less pesticides. So you can feel that you can eat these foods even if they're not organic. However, I have to say that when you eat pretty cleanly, you can now taste the difference between an avocado that's organic and not, even if there isn't any chemicals in it. So I think sometimes people don't like vegetables because they're also tasting the chemicals that are in the vegetables. So we talked a little bit about environmental factors, what we eat, the pollution, the, G, the cigarettes. And we all know someone that's probably lived to be 90 years old and they smoked every day of their life and they never had lung cancer. So genetically, some people, their genes don't turn on and some genes do turn on from the environment. They did a study long ago in, at Duke University on agouti mice. And what they found was by giving them chemicals they found that these little mice that were healthy looking became mice like this. But what they also did was they stopped feeding all those chemicals to these mice and the next three generations went back to this normal agouti uh, mouse. So what that tells us is that these things that we're using in our environment, that foods that we eat affect the expression of the genes and it also affects obesity. So they also did a study of the, um, the blood, the cord blood in babies. And what they found was there were so many high chemicals in the cord blood of the babies so that the babies in utero are moving around with a lot of chemicals from what mom has been eating. So importantly, you know, a lot of women know that we need to stop smoking in order to when we're, we have a baby inside. But I also maintain that the chemicals in there are really highly uh, bad for the baby. So if mom can eat organic, at least right before pregnancy, so there's less chemicals floating around, that would be ideal for the baby. There is some thought that some of the cancers occur because of the chemicals that were the baby was exposed to when a certain part of their body was developing. So like when their, their, the buds for their mammary gland land was developing, it could be that they got the mom ate something that had a high amount of chemicals. And we're not saying that's true for everybody, but the question is why do small children have um, cancers and where are they coming from? So this is free radicals. These are things that cause free radical damage, air pollution, inflammation that we talked about, mitochondria damage to the mitochondria, um, ultraviolet light. And we all definitely know that high amounts of ultraviolet light can lead to cancers later on on the skin. However, we also know that people need at least 15 to 20 minutes of vitamin D from the sun, if at all possible. And then certainly, People need to be checking their vitamin D to make sure it's not at least, it, make sure it's at least higher than 30. So, because that is also helpful for us right now um, during our immune situations with many viruses around us. So making sure that we have high amounts of vitamin D also help besides inflammation, but also help in terms of our immune system. So the free radicals accelerate aging. So people look older because of a high amount of free radical damage. And these can be caused by the air pollution, by liver breakdown of chemicals, by infection, and genes involved in making IL-6. So IL-6 is called interleukin-6, and those are, there are markers of inflammation. So there's also natural antioxidants, natural antidotes to free radical damage that counteract the inflammation and reduce uh, the radical mediated damage in our blood vessels and in our body. And we also know that vitamins such as E, C, selenium, and zinc. Now, the important thing is in the past, many years, hundreds of years ago, we had all these nutrients in our soil. And so people were getting them from the foods and hopefully they're getting them from the foods now. But I had a professor that showed that the amount of vitamin C in a 
um, orange was much less than in the past and is recorded, basically because when people pick the oranges now, they pick them when they're green and then they give gas in the storage area. So then they turn orange and we think they've been picked when they're orange, but they're actually not. So they don't have as much nutrients in them. But certainly individuals who smoke are depleting their body of vitamin C during the smoking process because the vitamin C is used to try to squelch these free radicals that are happening. So I listed foods that have all these antioxidants in it because I think that it's really important for individuals to know that they can get nutrients from foods, even though our soils may have less nutrients, at least getting some nutrients from foods is better. So if I were to maybe eat some kind of a, uh, a processed food all my life, I may have not as much nutrients. In fact, I preceptored with a doctor who only ate candy bars and drank Coke. And she had done this for 20 years because she was a very busy doctor. And then she ended up having a lot of depletion and dehydration and, and she looked really bad and got put in the hospital because she wasn't absorbing any nutrients in her body from these two things that she was eating. And I, I tell you, that is a really true story. So vitamin C you can find in many things and I'm an advocate of using uh, cooking with the rainbow amount of vegetables. So rainbow colors, like here's red peppers, cabbages, tomatoes, turnips, kale. And I don't like all of these things. So what you do is you pick the things that you really like and then figure out a way to make them taste good or take even a cooking class. I find that taking cooking classes can encourage people to eat better foods. Or you can take your vegetables places where somebody else will cut them up for you if you feel like that's too much of an effort to cut them. So vitamin E, you can find in brown rice, uh, wheat germ, whole grain breads, egg yolks. So some people think that you shouldn't have eggs because it has high cholesterol. And that's something that's been a myth for a long period of time. When I have people who have high cholesterol, I give them less than B6 and B12. And that makes their cholesterol go down. Guess what's in an egg yolk? less than B6 and B12. So even though there's cholesterol in egg yolk, there's also the B vitamins and lecithin so that you don't have high cholesterol because of eating eggs. So I say about five eggs a week is a great idea. It has so many good nutrients. And what I also find is many people don't eat a lot of protein in, in the morning. And so by giving them either a protein shake or having them eat an egg or having them eat nut butters or even fish. In Europe, they eat good protein in the morning that we would think, oh, you know, this protein, this chicken or whatever, we don't eat for breakfast, but they do eat for breakfast because we know that it's really good to have protein. So you can read the list here of where you get selenium right now in terms of antiviral and helping your immune system, selenium, zinc, vitamin E, vitamin C, beta carotene are very good besides being antioxidants, they're very good for the immune system. So getting zinc from sunflower seeds, mushrooms, selenium from Brazil nuts. So you two Brazil nuts a day gives you enough selenium that you do need to fight any kind of immune virus. So beta carotene you'll find in carrots, prunes, papaya, avocados, etc. So what's a flavonoid? Well, it's interesting because plants contain high amounts of flavonoids. And why do they contain high amounts of flavonoids? Well, if you think of it, any kind of a pest that attacks a plant that we are currently um, using pesticides for, the plant naturally makes an insecticide against that insect. So it makes it to protect the plant, but it also makes it because it's a flavonoid that we, we can have in high amounts. So anti-inflammatory, antioxidants, and you've probably heard about quercetin being very good as, as an antiviral also. So in apples, onions, tea, berries, and brassica vegetables are broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage. Those are all um, from the brassica vegetable family. But we also find flavonoids in botanicals. So ginkgo, hypericum is St. John's wort, but actually elderberry, and you've probably heard of elderberry being very effective for antiviral. 
and we make elderberry jams. It's a more, it's a common botanical that we use. So apples also, we don't think of apples, we just think about oranges as containing high amounts of vitamin C, but apples actually contain high amounts of vitamin C, um, as well as polyphenols and flavonoids that are antioxidants. So it's equivalent if we eat an apple to 15 milligrams of taking vitamin C. And vitamin C you can take in many ways. One is some people take um, the vitamin C that's in a powder form. Some people take vitamin C by itself. But I, I recommend drinking green tea, especially if you're a high amount of coffee because green tea has this amount less amount, but still an amount of caffeine. But with that caffeine, it also has theanine. So when I have people who have the jitters from ca ca coffee, the best thing for them is to take green tea because the theanine is calming to them. And I also give theanine to people when they are anxious or they need some kind of sleep. So I know I'm going pretty fast, but what we're gonna do is we'll have some time for questions and everything. But I think this is what's important is we need to keep our eye on vegetables and how we can put vegetables in our diet. So those of you that have kids in the audience, one of the best things you can do is have them have vegetables. Now, if kids don't like vegetables, there is a book called The Sneaky Chef. And there's a Sneaky Chef book for putting vegetables in foods that kids will not even know the vegetables are there. But there is also a sneaky chef for husbands. Um, if you're cooking and they're not eating vegetables and you, it will apply to wives, if husbands, you're someone that cooks for your wife. But making sure that we get healthy vegetables is of utmost importance to decrease inflammation in the body. Because what do we do if we're not getting vegetables? We're doing products that are very, um, high in um, sugars, high in fats, and things like that that are inflammatory. So here's um, our 10 steps to an anti-inflammatory diet. Uh, making sure that the oils you use are anti-inflammatory. So avoid like cooking oils that are lard or Crisco or those kinds of things. But you could use, I cook with olive oil. You can do almond oil, hazelnut oil. Right now, everybody is using air, air fryer. So using an air fryer, I may spray, and I make French fries that are awesome in my air fryer. And I spray avocado oil on these French fries and put a little bit of spices on them. And when I say spices, I'm not talking spicy. I'm really just saying anything that kind of gives it a flavor, you can go to Trader Joe's or some of the other stores and they have combination spices. If you're not used to knowing which spice is which, I'm not the best cook in the, more, in the world, but I sometimes cheat by getting combination spices. So eat foods um, high in the amounts of colorful vegetables. Now it is true, my neighbor next door used to have a, um, a farm, uh, not a farm, he used to have a place where you bought vegetables on the weekends, a farmer's market. And one of the things that he did was he knew that I ate organic vegetables. And so he's like, oh, we're going to have organic vegetables there. And I said, great, I'll come and I'll buy your organic vegetables. So I came, I bought the organic vegetables. That was great. Well, I went back the next week and I said, where's your organic vegetables? He said, well, you know, when we don't sell the vegetables, they don't last as long. And so because they don't last as long, we're not going to do our organic vegetables. Well, what's the reason that the vegetables last long? Because they've got preservatives in it. They don't last long because they're organic. So it is true that organic vegetables may not last long, but the same thing is, is that it's gonna affect your body in a positive way rather than you're taking in the pesticides with that. So eating high amounts of colorful vegetables, that may mean going to the store or having someone deliver. And these days you could have your vegetables delivered once a week or once every couple of days if you want to. Use spices and herbs to flavor your foods. Now, Actually, one of the spice or additives that I like is actually cocoa. So cocoa doesn't have sugar in it. So when I make my protein shake, I may put some cocoa in that just for flavoring. And cocoa has a high amount of antioxidants in it, and it has a lot of preventative. So cocoa is good. It's what we do with the sugar um, in the cocoa. 
spices, including curcumin, spices, including other types like rosemary. Rosemary is good because rosemary helps increase blood flow to the brain. So there's many different spices that will help that you can put on your foods that may make them taste better. Um, so some people on their vegetables, if they're not eating vegetables, I have them put a little bit of butter on them because at least they're eating vegetables, um, organic butter, of course. Um, having people put some like drizzle a little bit of nut butters on their vegetables or some um, type of, of thin running um, types of um, protein, meaning a sesame butter or something like that. So eating more fish, non-flesh proteins. I'm not saying that you all have to change over, but what I'm saying is we need to put more inflammatory foods in our diet. We really have about 80% inflammatory foods and 20% anti. I want to flip it over so that it is actually 80% healthy foods and 20% if you want some inflammatory foods in your diet. So eat organic as much as possible. I think some of the peanut allergies that people have have to do with some of the chemicals that are put on the peanuts, the glyphosates and things like that. So as much as possible, but go to ewg.org every year and they change it. They tell us who is using the, what vegetable has the most chemicals on it and what has the least. So when I'm eating out, I will have vegetables that I'm not gonna be able to control if they're organic or not, but I'm gonna eat the one that have, ones that have the least chemicals. Those chemicals affect our body. They actually cause inflammation. They cause um, your liver to have to work harder and they get laid down in the body tissues. Okay, identify and avoid food allergens and intolerances. I didn't list them here, but I would encourage you for about three weeks before Thanksgiving, because Thanksgiving is a holiday for food. You can do whatever you want, but I encourage people to go off wheat and gluten, and you can find many, many pastas that are wheat-free, gluten-free, that taste better now. When I first started this, there weren't very many, but there's an edamame pasta, there's good protein pastas. Um, Wheat, gluten, dairy, I would take out dairy. Now dairy doesn't mean rice milk or almond milk, it means cow's milk. I would take out sugar, I would take out pop, I would take out diet pop, um, coffee if you can, and just do it for two or three weeks and see how you feel. Now, sometimes people feel worse for two days and that's because your body is getting rid of all the toxins that it's holding inside. So just know that sometimes people feel better later. But if you're drinking a high amount of water, that can help wash the toxins out. If you feel a little bit fatigued or whatever, you could also see an acupuncturist if you've heard of them. Um, avoid or limit refined sugars and grains because the refining, there's no nutrients in it. It may taste good and give you a high and make you eat more, but there's no nutrients in it. So limit dairy products, use nuts and seeds as snacks. Many times people aren't getting enough protein in their diet. So I had them do a protein shake in the morning or eggs and then a few nuts between breakfast and lunch. And then the lunch that has fish or a salad, things like that, then use nuts in between that and then have a good meal that maybe is fish, once in a while red meat, um, but high amounts of vegetables. Our plate should be three fourths vegetables and one fourth of the protein or even less and especially drink plenty of water. Now, a lot of people don't drink water basically because it doesn't taste good. So do a taste test, go to the health food store or your, your Osco, Jewel Osco or somewhere and do a taste test, get about four bottles of water or five and then decide which water tastes good to you. So I happen to like a certain kind of water that is found in one of the stores and that's all I drink because I will drink that water because I really like it. And my dog will drink that water too, basically because I don't want my dog liver to have to filter out the chemicals and stuff in, in water. Now, if you don't have any sources for it, drinking water that's out of the faucet is a good idea. If you have reverse osmosis, that's a good idea, but at least drinking water is better than non-filtered, not, well, Drinking water out of a, a faucet is better than you having to filter all the chemicals that are in a lot of the pops. Okay, so in conclusion, let food be your medicine and let medicine be your food. And this is old adage from Hippocrates long ago because 
what we eat, we definitely can put in our bodies and we definitely can see the difference. See, think about the people who think that individuals have had a facelift when all they've done is they've changed to an anti-inflammatory diet. So I'm going to um, go ahead and if there's any way of asking questions, I can look at the chat box also and see if there's any questions there. Uh, I don't think there are there. Let's see. Okay, so you can post questions there or if you they can unmute, you could ask me any questions. And if not, I'm not at Northwestern anymore, but I have here the um, a way that you can reach me through drjuliefullup.com. All right, Dr. Julie Fulop, Fulop excuse me. Uh, thank you again for your presentation. Very comprehensive, giving us a really good window into the idea of inflammation and not only the things that cause it, but also the ways that we can prevent it and reduce it um, in our lives. We do have a few minutes, as Dr. Fulop mentioned, for questions. So if anyone wants to post anything here, um, we can certainly relay that to Dr. Phillip and address maybe one or two in these last few minutes we have. So I'll give you all just a, a minute or two. Um, and actually, Dr. Phillip, I'll kind of get things started and ask one quick one here. Sure. Just considering our um, kidney patients, um, particularly the kidney community, those that are living with kidney disease, have a transplant, are there particular foods that you may dissuade them from eating that might cause inflammation? And at the same time, on the flip side, maybe particular foods that might help them reduce inflammation. Okay, so all that I'm writing here is applies. However, if they are on chronic NSAID use, which they, they know or any type of getting to the cause of the pain is very important. So preventing any, any more kidney damage from not using high amounts of NSAID is important. And curcumin I have found is very, very beneficial for them. So it is true that, you know, high phosphorus foods or high amounts of potatoes, but I wouldn't say that for the vegetables. I think the vegetables that are, are not high amounts of foods with phosphorus in it are very beneficial for them. And curcumin is also extremely beneficial. So most of this does apply. Um, there are some specific herbs that are helpful. Um, I have given presentations for the Kidney Foundation on those, but I would say curcumin, getting onions, getting good foods that have the nutrients and high amounts of vegetables is your best thing. So that's a great question. Okay. Thank Hi, Judy. You. We have a question from okay. here in the room. Yes. Hi, how you doing? I noticed that in your list for, uh, uh, also colonitis? Colitis? Yes. Yes. So what would be the best thing to calm that inflammation? Okay, so the very best thing is what you take out of your diet. If you're currently eating wheat, gluten, dairy, sugar, diet pop, pop, those kinds of things, that would be the best thing to take out of your diet. Mm -hmm. um, going ahead and eating high amounts of vegetables and maybe even taking turmeric, which is curcumin. So turmeric is the herb and curcumin is the active ingredient and putting some of that on your foods would be very beneficial for it. The other thing that's very beneficial is getting a very good probiotic because the probiotics can protect the gut from inflammation itself. And then sometimes I work with people and give them a little bit of glutamine for a period of time that heals their gut also. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Good, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at what going off of inflammatory foods does for people and how much they feel so much better. And that's why all my, uh, for the last 20 years, that's all I've been doing is working people first with their diet. And I will give them other things that they may need, but working with their diet is a primary one. Okay, we have another question from in the room here. Hello, uh, thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, I am post-transplant. Yes. Um, the doctor who spoke just before you left the stage saying avoid NSAIDs because it damages the kidney or could cause damage to the kidney. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I had a stroke. And I, uh, since then I have been put on uh, baby aspirin, chronic. 
Mm-hmm. So I'm still continuing. So for a year and a half, I am on 81 milligrams of um, aspirin a day. Mm-hmm. How so do you're... I manage all this? Okay, so so here is the thing. Um, there's still the jury still is out. They are taking some people off 81 milligrams of aspirin. And when I work with my primary care physician and he wants me on aspirin, I say, can I do fish oil? And I do. Now I'm not saying you should do that, but I do agree that we're using way too much aspirin. I have people who have had ulcers or bleeding ulcers and inflammation because of that aspirin. Now the 81 milligrams, I would not go off of, I would talk with your doctor, but that's a very low amount, but certainly higher amounts of NSAIDs can damage the kidneys. Thank you. Uh, the and second the question other, is, second the, question. Question. The, the, other, the other thing is, you could actually ask them to do an inflammatory rate and see if they could, if your inflammation is high, but by changing all your foods, that can also help your inflammation. Second question, please. Oh, thank you very much for that. Uh, the second question is, what is the role of uh, homocysteine? Because I'm getting that checked and I'm, I, I'm on this tablet called Foltix, Folbic, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so what is the role of uh, homocysteine? Again, this is also post-stroke. Mm-hmm. So high amounts of homocysteine can cause problems in the cardiac area, but also in the area of stroke. And so what they can give you is your pathway on homocysteine is high. And what they can give you is B6, B12 in the fulvic and and fulvic um, folic acid. So that can help to decrease your homocysteine. Is your homocysteine going down with the drug? Um, Yes, Uh, the doctor said it is like 10.6 at the Uh latest reading and uh, she said that that's good. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the thing, the higher the homocysteine, the more risk for stroke and MI. So that's why she's wanting to keep it down for you. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Now, make sure you get the foods and you can look at what foods are high in folic acid, what foods are high in B6, B12, and make sure you eat those foods too. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. We have another question. Okay, I wish I could see everybody, but that's okay. (laughs) You were speaking of um, NSAIDs. Is it Tylenol and NSAID? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, like they were recommend, you were saying to recommend for anti for for fever, right? Well, okay, so so when people have a fever, what they're trying to do is decrease the fever. So they're not using these for a long period of time. However, I have to say that sometimes people, when they just have a very slight fever, they take those and, and really the body is trying to burn off the bacteria or the virus by getting, raising the body temperature. So certainly at a high body temperature, you wanna get the fever down. But especially with kids, I don't encourage with, you know, like a very small fever going ahead and just taking all the Tylenols and things to get it down. But you, you're, if you're doing it for a fever, you're only doing it for a short period of time. And what we're talking about with the NSAIDs is a long period of time. All right, because they recommend uh-huh. uh, Tylenol also for pain. Um, you know, maybe I am wrong on the Tylenol. Let me just kind of look at here. Is Tylenol an NSAID? Because if they're recommending it for pain, okay, so Tylenol is not an NSAID, um, even though it, it sounds like it. Um, so Tylenol is not included as an NSAID. Okay. So I'm, I'm corrected here, okay? But at the same time, when people have pain, I want to get to the cause of the pain rather than just saying, let's take it. So my mother was a nurse. And anytime I had a headache, she would say, oh, just go take it, take something to bring it down. And I was like, well, wait a minute. Why am I having a headache? Number one, for me, when I get a headache, it's because I'm not drinking enough water. Number two, if I have a headache, it may be that I'm exposed to something or I'm around, like if I'm around a lot of perfumes, I'll get a headache. If I'm around cigarette smoke, I'll get a headache. So the answer is not to stay in the cigarette smoke or stay around the perfume and take Tylenol. The answer really is for me to go ahead and 
remove myself from that area and drink a lot of water to move whatever it is that's giving me a headache through. So I'm not against the Tylenol, but I'm just saying that many times we can look at what's the cause of the problem and address the cause of the problem rather than taking a high amount of things. But you are totally right that Tylenol is not considered an NSAID, even though it's anti-inflammatory. And so that's allowed. Good question. All right, Monica, I have no further questions in the chat. Do you have any further questions in the room? Wesley, I don't see any other questions here. Okay. Oh, wait, Wonderful. one more. Oh, great. One more. <laughs> Hi, the question about the inflammatory. Uh, I have chronic back pains, mm -hmm. and usually uh, they get irritated, and they always want to have me to take pain pills for it, but I want to find out what can I do to relieve the inflammation. Okay. So do you remember me talking about the patient that had a back surgery, and he was in chronic back pain? Yes. And what I did was take him off all inflammatory foods for three weeks. I gave him curcumin in terms of a capsule. And what happened is the, the back pain may have still been there a little, but because I decreased the inflammation, his back pain went down. So that's where I would start for you. Um, I, I'm not sure if you eat a lot of inflammatory foods right now, but that's where I would start. Maybe put curcumin on your foods um, and, and drink uh, do you drink enough water? Yeah. Okay, good. I good. don't. I gave up pop juice, so I may drink a cup of coffee in the morning, but mostly I have is tea and water. Okay, that's good. That's good. Then I would work on your foods, and sometimes going off wheat and gluten can decrease the inflammation also. And then what you could do also is try to find someone that would figure out why is the back pain there. So I've had chronic back pain and I went to a physical therapist who actually gave me back exercises that I do every morning. Okay. So I, I can't diagnose or, or know what your back pain is, but I, I would say spend a little bit more time trying to figure out, is there a reason for this back pain? So for me, it was muscles that weren't very, my core wasn't strong. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Okay, I, I noticed that uh, on some on your inflammatory list, you had some, like, I think I saw apples and something else. And then I looked on your anti inflammatory list. And you had some of the same things. Like okay. I saw collards and what was it? So uh, I'm not sure collards, what turnip greens. Right, I, I'm not uh, sure why. Celery, uh, what else was it? Celery, I'm, tomatoes. I'm looking, I'm looking to see where you're finding that apples are inflammatory because I don't believe they are inflammatory. It was on a, on a list that you had up there. And Is I was this one? Said, Is it this one? Is it this list here? It was, a, a, you had two lists. One was inflammatory and one was anti-inflammatory. Um, and I saw some of the same things on both I, lists. I'm not sure where the inflammatory list is that says that apples are inflammatory because they're not. And I don't see it here. I'm going through, can you see what I'm looking at? Yes. Okay, I'm going through this whole presentation and I don't- Okay. Just pass. This one here. Okay. So you I'm not the one before that. This one. Oh, that's the one. That's it. That was it. This one. Okay. That's so that is not saying these are inflammatory. This is contaminated. Contaminated. Okay. Okay. So I'm really glad you asked that question because these are the ones that have the most chemicals in them. So that's the ones you want to eat organic. So it's not the apples that are inflammatory. It's the chemicals that are in the apples. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you for asking. Are there any other questions here in the room? 
I don't see any. Okay. All right. Well, I think that concludes this presentation. I have no further questions here on the chat on the virtual side, Monica. Um, so if we want to wrap up, I'll just say thank you again to Dr. Judy Phillip. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation, very comprehensive. And Monica, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Have thank a good you, life, everybody. Judy, and thank you, Wesley.